everyone, and thank you for joining our double header today. The topic is running the White House, and our guests are people who have either been there, done that, or watched it very closely and are among the nation's leading experts on it. Uh, in just over 40 days, people will walk into empty offices at the White House and start to take over. Um, in the midst of any presidential transition, at some level, everyone is green and new, even if they've been there before, because the positions are different and the president is different. So events both here and abroad do not discriminate based on experience. And it makes this period of a presidential transi transition absolutely crucial. Learning curves are expected naturally, but the starting point on the curve is higher than almost any job in the world. Given those constraints, incoming presidents are always under pressure to meet various criteria and strike balances. Any president elected with a clear mandate for change still has to run the risk of either seeming overzealous or underzealous. How they manage their agenda is based really on the people that they recruit. And so that's why we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about how one actually staffs the White House, what those people do, and how they in turn work with others to run the government. We've got two panels today, a true double header. The first panel are include a number of our Miller Center fellows who have either worked in White Houses or study White Houses, as well as a very special guest. And the second panel features um, the authors of a new book about James Baker, perhaps the most successful White House Chief of Staff in modern history, moderated by one of our own. But first to the first panel, we're delighted to welcome Chris Liu, Dave Marchick, Eric Edelman, and Katie Tempest. I'm gonna give very brief introductions and then I'm gonna steer you to, to a place where you can get their longer and very impressive bios. Uh, over an immensely impressive 20 years in public service, even though he still looks like he's fresh out of college. Chris <laughs> Lou is uh, the Miller Center's Teresa Sullivan Practitioner Senior Fellow. He has worked in all three branches of the federal government including seven years in the Obama administration. Many of those served out of the White House. Eric Edelman is a Miller Center senior fellow who spent decades as a career foreign service officer, as well as senior positions at the State Department and at the White House, prominently in the Bush 43 presidency. Katie Dunpus, Katie Dunn Tempus is a Miller Center senior fellow and a non-resident senior fellow in governance studies at the Brookings Institution, like me. Uh, where she directs the White House Transition Project. Uh, and she's also been connected to the Center for Presidential Transition at the Partnership for Public Service. She's an indispensable scholar on the American presidency, including staffing the White House. And then finally, Dave Marchick, our special guest, who serves in a volunteer role as the director of the Center for Presidential Transition at the Partnership for Public Service, which is just a phenomenal organization and one of our most important partners. Uh, Dave has also worked in the State Department and at the White House, and we can't thank him enough for the partnership that we've forged. For longer bios um, on our folks, you can go to uh, a short URL, M-I-L-L-R dot C-R slash W-H, or just go to the Miller Center website and the page for this event, and you can get longer bios on our panelists. So we're gonna jump right in to a discussion here before moving on to our second panel. Uh, and I just wanna broach the question, presidential transitions need to focus on going from election to governing, but you've actually gotta staff this White House first, as well as staffing the government. So what does that look like? How does it work? How do you, how do you pick a staff and put a staff together? I'm going to go right to Chris Liu, and then uh, we'll go around the circle and come back to Dave for an assessment of how it's going. So, Chris? It's complicated. Uh, it's a big puzzle. Every piece affects every other piece of the puzzle. First and foremost, you want people who have experience and are capable. And if it's a cabinet pick, people who are capable of running large federal agencies, as if it's somebody in the White House, it's somebody who's got both policy and political chops and uh, is close to the uh, the president elect. And so uh, it is hard, and, and particularly for an administration like this one that will value diversity, 
Um, you know, uh, it, it's it's not, in, not only ensuring that your cabinet is, is diverse, your White House staff is diverse, but each of the clusters within that, the economic team, the national security team. Uh, and then obviously you want people who the president trusts and who he wants around him and who make for a good team. And so uh, it is, it, it's extraordinarily complicated. Uh, and, and even the best of administrations often struggle with this. And there's always a couple of people that just don't work out. Eric, you're nodding your head, particularly on the point of struggle. Uh, from you, from how you've seen this before, where's the struggle? Well, I think what Chris was really saying uh, is that you know uh, personnel is policy, um, and you know Bob Gates used to joke when I worked for him that when he was on the faculty at Texas A&M, the political science department wouldn't let him anywhere near a classroom because he would come in and basically say the. The organization chart doesn't matter at all. What matters is the relationships among the people who get appointed to all these uh, these jobs. You know, and there, from my point of view, I, I think uh, President-elect Biden um, and Vice President-elect Harris have, uh, you know, done a, an excellent job. First, in first instance, uh, and I think Chris would probably agree with this, uh, staffing the White House first, uh, because uh, many administrations have foundered on, you know, putting cabinet officers first and only then belatedly getting to the White House staff. But the president really runs the staff and the vice president runs their staff. And it's important to have those people in place. Uh, the early returns, I think, are, are pretty impressive. Uh, although I do think something uh, that appears to be going on now may uh, be a bit of a wrinkle to go to Chris's point, there's always wrinkles. Um, you know, many administrations have suffered from uh, appointing teams of folks who can't get along, national security advisors who don't get along with secretaries of state or secretaries of state and defense who don't get along with one another, uh, or, you know, secretaries of state and defense who don't get along with the national security advisor. I've seen almost every permutation and combination of the above. Um, you know, at least at the outset, the er early announcements by President-elect Biden of Jake Sullivan at, um, as National Security Advisor, Tony Blinken as Secretary of State, and Avril Haines, uh, full disclosure, Avril and I co-chaired a task force together, so it's not surprising I'm saying nice things about her, but they, they were, they were uh, all people who had worked uh, for Vice President Biden, had uh, close personal relationships with him, uh, and worked well with each other. So rather than a team of rivals, you had what was emerging as a team of colleagues. Uh, how General Lloyd Austin will fit into that, uh, I think, is a uh, you know uh, an open an open question, um, and we can talk more about that later. And then the only other piece I would add is, uh, from my perspective as somebody who worked in the office of the Vice President, um, I think. Uh, you know, uh, Vice President-elect Harris has uh, served herself extremely well, both by appointing Tina Flournoy as her chief of staff, someone who's very experienced, knows their way around the block, um, but also uh, Nancy McEldowney, who uh, has been named as her national security advisor, who is a very experienced foreign service officer, former ambassador to Bulgaria, former director of the uh, George P. Schultz uh, National Foreign Affairs Training Center uh, in Arlington for the Foreign Service. Um, Nancy happens to also have been my DCM briefly in Turkey, and I know she will do an outstanding job for Vice President-elect Harris and for the entire team. So I think they're off to a good start. Katie, you've tracked the staffing of the White House and the staffing of the agencies. Um, I, I think there's a going presupposition in this call that starting with the White House makes sense. Um, what, are you, what do you see when you look at this question and what do you see so far? Right. I think that uh, Eric was exactly right. It's most important to make the high level White House appointments first and then follow through with the cabinet departments. What I see as sort of the two most um, noteworthy features of the appointment so far is the emphasis on experience and diversity, uh, a stark contrast to his predecessor. Um, and in addition, there has already been a lot of historic firsts with probably many more to come. But having Janet Yellen as the first female treasury secretary, having Alejandro Mayorkas as the first secretary, uh, Hispanic, um, as the first secretary of the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, they can really break a lot of new ground. And so far, they seem to be doing that quite well. With, with very experienced people. There are a lot of firsts for whom it's not their first rodeo. Um, so Dave, I want to draw on you. You've done this extraordinary work in standing up the Center for Presidential Transitions. 
you've been at it for a year, you've been studying White House structure, you've been studying the people who have had these jobs before, and you've been talking to them. You've had a great series of podcasts interviewing so many of these people, including especially chiefs of staff. So let me start there, if we might, and then go where you want to go. Uh, tell us about the role of the chief of staff, what you've learned from your conversations, and what you think about the pick so far that uh, President-elect Biden has made. Great. Well, thank you. Let me let me first thank you, Bill, and give a shout out to the Miller Center because um, you know what I've seen from the Miller Center is not only great scholarly work of which I've been a beneficiary, uh, but more importantly, and e perhaps equally importantly, is you've had a huge impact on the debate. Uh, you've had several events, several publications that have literally shaped the way the ascertainment debate played out the way that the structure has played out. And I think that it's, it's a credit to you and the team that the Miller Center not only is contributing in terms of scholarly research, but actual impact. So um, I've had the pleasure of you know, studying basically all the modern transitions since Carter and some older transitions, including the two worst transitions, uh, 1860 when seven states seceded and 1932 when we had the height of the depression Hitler came to power and the wheels came off during the Hoover to, uh, to Roosevelt interregnum. And I think you're gonna hear you know, some great wisdom from Peter and Susan about perhaps the best chief of staff and a very good model, which is James Baker. So what we've learned is that a strong chief of staff that has room to hire his or her, actually his, there's never been a female chief of staff, hopefully there will be soon, um, staff and to kind of go off and do that on our own. So the transition team, which Chris ably led for the uh, Obama team, really builds and builds and builds. It's a startup, it goes from nothing to almost a thousand people. Chris started over a subway shop uh, on the hill and ended up running the best transition in history up until this date. Um, so the earlier that, that the president elect can name the White House chief of staff, the better. Actually, George W. Bush asked Andy Card to be his chief of staff before the election, and Andy agreed, and he started working on pulling together the White House uh, staff before the election, which is actually very positive. Reagan chose Baker because he saw what happened with Jimmy Carter. So Jimmy Carter reacted to what happened under Nixon, which is you had a strong chief of staff, H.R. Haldeman, who went to jail. And he said, that doesn't appeal to me. So I'm going to be my own chief of staff. I'm going to have a weak centralized structure and I'm going to have a cabinet government. Um, as your oral histories have shown and as our podcasts have shown, that didn't work very well. Um, he then adjusted about halfway in and had an effective chief of staff. Reagan came in and appointed Baker. He didn't really know Baker that well. In fact, Baker ran two campaigns against Reagan, the Gerald Ford campaign and then the George H.W. Uh, Bush campaign in the primaries. Um, and he gave Baker power to pick his own people. And Baker brought in pragmatic, experienced people to the dismay of kind of the California crowd for Reagan and also to the dismay of conservatives. And Reagan had, and Baker perhaps had the most consequential role as chief of staff. He had a delicate negotiation with Ed Meese who was, who was Bush's chief of staff in, I'm sorry, Reagan's chief of staff in California. And he basically, Reagan appointed um, Baker, but then said, make it right with Meese. So Me Baker went to Meese and said, all right, you have cabinet rank, you get to be on the policy councils. What I'll take is I'll take the office and I'll take control of the schedule. And Baker smartly took the most powerful, most centralized things that he could control. And he became the most important person for Reagan. I think Biden has done a very good job by appointing someone that he trusts, someone with great experience, and doing it early. And so I think that Chris Liu probably has the record for running the best transition in history to date. But unfortunately for Chris, I think Biden's going to move <laughs> Chris and Obama out of the way um, based on the experience, the organization, and speed with which uh, he's organizing this transition, which we can talk about more. Dave, I want to stick with one point there. Since you made the comparison, I, I can't help but ask the follow-up question. Um, Chris, on the, uh, as the incoming director of the transition, 
had a very collaborative partner that was leaving, uh, a, a president who wanted the transition to go smoothly, a chief of staff, Josh Bolton, who had been part of the transition coming in, knew what worked and what didn't work. Uh, that's not the case now. So they're doing really well um, against an, an outgoing administration that's playing defense rather than collaboration and being on the same team. What's that like? And, and what's it like to be in the middle of all that in the role that you all play? Well, I think the challenges that Biden has faced are ameliorated, ameliorated by the fact that he's the most experienced person to ever become president of the United States. And his transition team is the deepest, broadest, most experienced uh, transition team ever. Um, so actually what hasn't been written is that the Trump White House did a very good job up until election day. Uh, the transition planning was run by a fellow named Chris Liddell, who actually has a lot of transition experience. He ran Romney's transition. Obviously Romney didn't win, but Liddell did a very good job along with Mike Levitt in planning that transition. And future transition teams, I'm sure including Chris, have studied the Romney model uh, since 2012. So Chris Liddell was very buttoned up. He was very organized. He implemented the entire uh, statute. Um, and then things went off the rails you know, after that with the GSA delay. Once GSA ascertained, actually there's been pretty good cooperation across the government. There have been some pockets of resistance, the Post and other papers have reported on them. But I would say that those are the outlying agencies as opposed to most of the agencies have been very cooperative. I'll give you an example. Perhaps the most important thing that can happen in this transition is not in Eric's area of expertise, which is national security, which is typically the most important part of any transition. It's actually healthcare. It's Operation Warp Speed. It's the joint effort of the health department, the defense department, and many other agencies to get the vaccine into our arms. And Alex Azar has done a very good job. He basically set the tone and said, anything the Biden team needs, we're turning it over to them. And he's been very, very cooperative and that's for the benefit of the country. I think people forget that this is not about benefiting Biden, it's about benefiting the country to ensure that the, the next government can deliver on the major problems our country faces. That's really great. So uh, questions are starting to come in and please send them in. There's a Q&A button on your screen. Send them in and I'll collect them and, uh, and feed them into our folks. But I wanna do two quick rounds, two quick lightning rounds before going to public questions. Um, Dave touched on healthcare as an issue. We've touched on national security. What are these policy councils and how they work? First, technically, what is the council and who sits on the council? But what is managed at the staff level and what is managed at the so-called principal level? And I'll just sort of throw this out there. I'm looking at Chris, but anybody that wants to jump in on this, please do. Well, I, I will do the the two domestic ones, and I'm, I'm sure Eric can do the National Security Council uh, really well. Um, there's the Domestic Policy Council, there's a, a, a National Economic Council um, to coordinate. Um, and and it, it's to both surface uh, issues that need to be flagged for the president, uh, it's to guide policy making, uh, it's to resolve disputes, it's to ensure that agencies that have equities and different policies are consulted. But, you know, we think about DPC, NEC, and NSC, but truthfully, there are interagency processes happening on an ad hoc basis on every possible issue. Uh, you know, we ran a, we had an office of energy and, and climate change in the Obama administration. I suspect that there will be, in fact, we know that there will be some type of climate czar on the domestic side for President Biden, the same way that um, Secretary Kerry is going to coordinate it on the national security side. And I think people forget, you know what, the, the, the vast majority of government work is pretty siloed in government agencies. And so these councils, whether it's a formal or informal, are a way to coordinate the work so it best furthers the president's agenda. So technically the council are the cabinet members, but um, at a staff level, the White House staff are the ones that are connecting those folks on the key issues and the folks that report up to the cabinet members. Yeah, exactly. Eric, on the NSC side, there are often a lot of debates about uh, the White House controlling policy or deferring out to the agencies. What does that look and feel like? Well, I mean, the, the National Security Council was uh, created in statute by the National Security Act of 1947. And, and actually, when you look at the statute, 
It, it, there are an uh, extremely small number of people who are statutory members of the National Security Council, and it's changed over time, so I may not have the exact number now, but it, uh, it was originally the president, the vice president, uh, the secretary of state, and secretary of defense. That was it. Um, I think Treasury has been added, and, and there may be one or two others. There's actually no statutory position of national security advisor. That actually grew uh, out of practice, uh, both by... Um, uh, particularly President Eisenhower and then subsequent presidents, and of course, uh, with the role Henry Kissinger played in the Nixon administration, it became a, a much more of a, a visible position than it had been uh, been previously. And the role of the council uh, was essentially to coordinate political military matters, essentially uh, coordinating uh, between the, the White House, the Department of State and the newly created by the National Security Act of 1947, unified Department of Defense that the, the act uh, brought together the Department of the Navy and the Department of War that had been independent and now uh, you know, made them a, um, a single unified entity with a statutorily based Joint, uh, joint Chiefs of Staff and a, and a civilian Secretary of Defense. Um, the role of the council has grown over the years and uh, every administration has an initial directive by the national security advisor, which basically sets out who will be invited to national security council meetings. And it changes with every administration uh, because the national security act of 1947 is extremely flexible. And at least in national security policy, it always ends up reflecting to some degree, the president's own managerial style um, and predisposition in terms of how they like to be briefed, how they like to have decisions brought to them and formulated. Um, and uh, there, there can be tensions. I mean, of, of course, the Nixon NSC uh, famously became very centralized, very secretive. Uh, it got to the point where some of the cabinet agencies were literally spying on the NSC. Uh, David is smiling because I'm sure he knows that that history well. Um, and you had some of that, you know, some of those same uh, concerns, I think, about the Obama NSC. Bob Gates was very, very vocal uh, about this, uh, as was Leon Panetta, feeling that they had been really micromanaged by the NSC staff uh, during the Obama years. So it depends very much on the style of the president. I mean, President Trump's uh, you know, style has been much more hands-off, but his national security advisors, and there have been four of them have, have you know, taken different approaches to managing relations with the, um, you know, with, the, uh, with the agencies with varying degrees of success. Andy, let me jump in there. You've tracked White House staff turnover. Uh, Eric mentioned the four national security advisors in the Trump White House. Um, so what's that all about? How long do people typically serve in these jobs? And um, do you have any sense of what drives fast turnover or slow turnover in a White House? Right, well, generally speaking, people stay uh, in these White House jobs. I, I study sort of the most senior level of the White House and they typically stay for a year and a half. But what we've seen in this last administration is turnover is simply off the charts. Uh, he has, in, after the first year, he more than tripled the Obama rate of first year turnover. And I think in terms of trying to think about what influences turnover, um, it really depends on the administration. And I would say in the Trump administration, it was very much a function of the chief executive and how his, what his managerial style was like. He had a tendency to fire people far more than his predecessors. And not only that, he would fire them publicly and publicly humiliate them. Um, and the turnover wasn't just in the White House. There were record, was record level, level turnover in the cabinets. Um, there was record level turn, turnover in sort of the undersecretary positions as well. And what we also saw uh, related to that is that not, in, not only in the political appointments, but in some of the senior executive service, there seemed to be a high rate of turnover in the second and third year of his administration, suggesting that people who could have stayed because they were civil servants decided to leave. So the Biden administration and the transition has its work cut out for it because not only does it have to fill the roughly 4,000 political positions, but there's a great deal of civil service positions that are vacant compared to normal. So their hands are, are going to be full. Um, and just one more point I wanted to make when you were talking about um, kind of this relationship between White House staffing and the councils and kind of trying to coordinate across the government. Because I think one of the most noteworthy features about the development of White House staff in the 20th century 
is that I would say ever since about um, Nixon or even Johnson, you see this kind of centralization of authority and policymaking and expertise in the White House. It used to be that White Houses had much smaller staffs and that meant that cabinet secretaries and undersecretaries had far more influence and far more discretion and independent independence. And as the White House staff has grown and created all of these councils like the Domestic Policy Council and the National Security Council, what has happened is that some of the power that those cabinet secretaries enjoyed in the past, they are now sometimes being dictated to by the White House staff. And so there has been this shift in power across the executive branch. Dave, um, we've touched on the policy dimensions of this and the turnover pieces. I just fill in some of the details of who else is in the White House, and as, as you're watching the Biden team come in, how are they filling some of these other positions? And then we can talk about, Katie mentioned, the staffing of the rest of the government, which you, you all also track really carefully and deeply. But talk about some of these other positions. We see communications directors, press secretaries, office of personnel, legislative affairs, political affairs. What, what do these people do all day? How does it work? Well, they play, they play very important roles. Chris Liu was the cabinet secretary, which I don't think Biden is named as cabinet secretary, but that role is a very important role. They coordinate what the cabinet does on a daily basis so that there is centralized coordination and collaboration. Um, the type of people that, that President like Biden has named, you know, I think as Eric said, are they're highly experienced, highly competent people. Just today, he named Jeff Zients. Um, who's someone that you know we know well, and he helped run the transition along with Ted Kaufman. I've known Jeff for a long time. We've we've been friends. He's got a very good business background. He's one of the most competent, organized, effective people I've ever met in my private sector, my public sector career. Um, and he's going to be in charge of of COVID coordination, as he said today. He's not a doctor. He's not a scientist. He's good at execution. And I think that it's, it's emblematic of, I think, the way that, that Biden is approaching it is to appoint someone like Jeff to that role. The challenge is not just in science, it's about how do you get 300 million vac vaccine doses into Walmarts, into Target parking lots, into rural communities with dry ice as fast as possible so that we can get to herd, immun herd immunity and get back to our normal lives. So, you know, Jeff is a perfect example. I think the, the communications team he's appointed is, is first rate Jen Saki. She uh, was the spokesperson of the State Department. She was communications director in the Obama White House. She's worked on the transition. She's a pro. Kate Bedingfield, again, someone that's been around for a while, a real pro. Uh, they're diverse, they're experienced, and they are wildly organized. Um, let's start going to questions from the audience. So uh, there, there's a basic question that I think I want to start with, uh, with Dave and then uh, Chris and, and Katie and Eric. In federal agencies, who becomes the acting heads during and after the transitions? Do current political appointees resign? Do senior career civil servants become acting heads until a new presidential nominee is confirmed by the Senate. And, you know, there's a push in the first week to confirm four or five cabinet secretaries, but you're often months and months before the full cabinet of 13, 14, 15 people, whoever formally is designated as cabinet secretary is named. What's actually going on there? Who's in charge? Well, we actually put out a report on this very issue last week. I'm hopeful that the data you just articulated is not accurate because our data shows that um, around 95% of cabinet nominees, the 15 statutory cabinet agencies actually receive a confirmation hearing pre-inauguration and that around 85% of them get in within two or three days. Each administration, as Eric uh, mentioned, has one or two folks that have problems, um, but most of them get in quickly. And the problem is the next layer so the deputy secretaries, the undersecretaries. So we've done a lot of studying of the Bush uh, administration because they had the delay. So I'll give you this some data. So Katie mentioned there are 1,250 Senate confirmed positions. At the 100 day mark, which would put Biden at May 1st, 
At the 100-day mark, under the Bush administration, there was one Senate-confirmed person in the health department. If you think about the pace with which we want to get the vaccine out the door, where hopefully 60, 70, 80% of Americans are vaccinated by May 1st, I'm hoping that Biden can get many, many more people in the Department of Health into the Pentagon and others. With respect to the acting officials, this is a key issue where Eric Edelman and the Bush administration's work probably created the gold standard. So Bush instructed his entire cabinet and the White House to collaborate with whomever won, McCain or Obama. He obviously preferred McCain, but he basically said, be fair. And they coordinated with the Obama team coming in, Chris can tell you. So they talked about policies. We've spent a lot of time with Steve Hadley, National Security Advisor for Bush. He met with the Obama team and said, all right, we have these 12 issues, whatever the number was, that we need to decide between now and January 20th. Which of these 12 do you want me to decide so that we clear the way for you? Or which of the ones do we want, do you want me not to decide so you have flexibility? And the, and the Obama team basically said, all right, we want number three, we want number seven, number eight, maybe you could fudge that. They worked through it. And Eric did that at the, at the Defense Department. It was a buttoned up red carpet treatment. The acting officials typically, you know, there's one president at a time. So Trump will name the outgoing, the acting officials until January 20th at noon, and then Biden can name them. This is an area where collaboration between the outgoing and the incoming is absolutely imperative so that they can get qualified people that have the confidence of the president elect in those acting positions, not just at the cabinet level, but in Eric's old job, you know, the Under Secretary of Defense for Policy, in uh, the FDA commissioner, in the Assistant Secretary of Health responsible for pandemic and emergency response. That's a pretty important position. You want someone competent there if there's not a Senate confirmed position. So this is where collaboration between the, the the outgoing and the incoming is actually absolutely imperative. You know, Chris may have additional thoughts on that, but that's my perspective. Yeah, the, the, the metaphor that seems to come to mind is it's like a square dance. And when when you change, suddenly you're dancing with somebody you don't know. So Chris, Derek, Katie, what is, what is that like? Well, I, there's a lot of processes that typically happen. Um, in 2016, uh, I went back and checked on November 7th, the day before election day, uh, all political appointees received a memo from the president asking us to submit our letters of resignation. Uh, and then they were all promptly accepted. Uh, and, uh, and that gave the next uh, administration, whoever it was going to be, the chance to fill the jobs. I am not aware that that, and Dave may know, I'm not aware that that message has gone out right now to Trump political appointees. And so uh, I hope it certainly does go out or otherwise, you know, one of the first acts of the uh, Biden administration will be to you know fire several thousand people, um, but you're right. What happens is that you, you know, the the outgoing administration in each agency there's a line of succession. Uh, you follow the line of succession and you appoint uh, an acting head or you sort of designate this person's the acting head. In 2016, when I was deputy secretary of labor, we had a person chosen. But I asked the incoming Trump officials. They said, look. This is who we've chosen. If you want us to choose somebody else, you can choose somebody else. They were fine with our choice. Uh, and because it took them a couple months to actually get a confirmed secretary, that person did serve for an extended period of time. So it is. this is not just an academic decision that is made along the way. And it kind of flows all the way down through the agencies. You know, as Dave said, it's going to be very hard and even the best of times to get deputy secretaries, undersecretaries, assistant secretaries confirmed. And so you will likely have acting people serving for an extended period of time uh, in many of these agencies. And so it does behoove the transition team to think very carefully, uh, whether it's a career acting official or a political person who's going to serve in that position. Eric, there are some famous national security crises where the handoff didn't go well from, from one administration to the next. Bay of Pigs was one of those where the operation was planned in the outgoing Eisenhower administration, uh, Black Hawk Down in Somalia. Uh, the peacekeeping operation started, I think, in the lame duck period in the Bush 41 administration and got handed over. Operationally, how much of that is acting people being responsible for things that political appointees had planned and the new appointees not knowing and understanding what exactly was going on? Or how much of that is just 
failed enterprises that weren't designed well from the beginning. Yeah, I mean, I, <clears throat> yeah, much as I'd like to, you know, say that the delay in confirming the, the all important undersecretaries and and uh, assistant secretaries is responsible for these foreign policy disasters, I, I don't think that would really be fair. I mean, I think. Uh, you know, the evidence of the Bay of Pigs and certainly uh, President Kennedy's testimony after the fact was not that, uh, you know, they weren't briefed or that they didn't have people in place, but that they hadn't asked the right questions uh, about the uh, about the operation. And with regard to the Somalia intervention, I mean, I mean, <laughs> there were some transition issues uh, that affected that, but a, a lot of it really had to do with the um, uh, evolution of the mission uh, in the early uh, Clinton administration, and and I think less to do with uh, the the lack of, of people in place. I mean, in fact, you had both Les Aspen and and, uh, um, and uh, the Undersecretary Frank Wisner in place uh, when those things transpired. So I don't think you can lay those at the feet of you know of a failed transition. But to, just to um, you know, to footstop David and Chris's points, um, there usually is a major effort uh, at at a minimum to get the Secretary of State and Secretary of Defense uh, confirmed before the handoff goes, because people are concerned that the national security of the United States is at risk if you don't have people in place. Um, <clears throat> it's also the case that you tend, however, not to necessarily get uh, the the uh, sub cabinet people. Uh, in place as quickly as you would like. In Bush 43, I recall uh, that it was, I think, March or April uh, before Paul Wolfowitz was confirmed as, as uh, Deputy Secretary of Defense. Uh, I think the assistant uh, unders and the assistant secretaries came even later. I think Doug Fife in June and uh, J.D. Uh, Crouch and some of the other assistant secretaries at Defense not until uh, July uh, uh, got confirmed. In, in this instance, uh, in part because of some of what Katie described about President Trump's management style, uh, not only have you had a lot of people fired, you've had a lot of people not replaced. So you have an enormous number of people who are already acting uh, and probably acting at maybe uh, you know one and a half uh, or even two levels above where they normally would be sitting you know, in the bureaucracy, whether they're political appointees or, uh, or career. Um, and so at state and defense in particular, you have uh, really uh, yawning gaps. And I, I think uh, kind of institutional repair uh, in those two institutions, as well as the, inter uh, the intelligence community is going to be, it's, it's a, the intelligence community has a slightly different problem, which is politicization at the top. But um, in all three of those uh, key institutions for national security, a certain amount of institutional repair is going to have to go on. It's going to have to be, a, I think, a major preoccupation of the Biden White House in its early, uh, you know, in its early days. Katie, thoughts on, on yeah, those I, I, they go deeper down? Right. Um, I was going to add a couple of things. One, I think, is that um, what's really important, and Chris knows a lot about this, but the importance of the agency review teams that have already been dispersed across the federal government, those people are sort of actively thinking about how they're going to queue up their appointees, who they're going to put as acting. I mean, they, they're on top of this, but it is a really difficult job. The other point I was going to make is that the delay in the GAO's ascertainment of President-elect Biden we can really see, you know, a lot of people say, well, it doesn't matter because uh, Vice President Biden is so experienced and his team is experienced, it doesn't matter. Well, it does matter because the FBI has not been able to process any background checks. They missed about 21 days where they could have been processing some of these people, not just the cabinet secretaries, but the undersecretaries and the deputy secretaries and other political appointees across the federal government. So, you know, we tend to sort of, now that we're sort of out of that phase where there was no ascertainment, we kind of don't really think about it, but actually I think it could create bottlenecks that are very important in the, in the coming weeks. Bill, can I just make a comment about that? Because yeah. I think it's a very important point that Katie just made. You know, at, at least in the national security side, Chris can, and David can speak maybe more to the, the domestic side, but, you know, one of my uh, foreign service mentors, uh, you know, once told me that, uh, transition time is equal to three times government time because it, it is a period of time when while you're working very hard and you're under a lot of pressure, it's nothing like you know the uh, fire hose drinking you're gonna do once you 
uh, get in, you know, to government and suddenly have to pick up the reins, particularly with all of these uh, loose, you know, loose ends that have, are being left here that we've mentioned already. And so the loss of this time actually is is really important. I mean, I came in very early, you know, in the um, Bush 43 transition uh, to came back from Washington from overseas, and I could literally see the, you know, the impact that the lost time had made. And in that case, it wasn't just the contested election for 36 days. It also was the fact that that then ran into the holiday season. Um, and so in effect, what is meant to be a three month transition in a, you know, came, became a three week transition. Um, and famously the 9-11 commission cited this as one of the reasons why the Bush 43 administration might not have been as prepared as it might've been uh, for what happened, you know, on September 11th. So there can be very real world consequences from, from the delay that's already taken place. Let, let me ask you all a question about, one question that comes in from several members of the audience is about John Kerry's role. Um, uh, Joseph Kratz asks, what will be the process for former Sec Secretary Kerry to build a team and process around his newly created position? Um, Others are asking about the prominence of climate change in the administration. I'm curious as to what you all think and see in this. My understanding is that he's appointed as the special envoy, which is largely a function of the State Department, but there are often czars in administrations, a domestic climate czar. We had a drug czar before. We had a um, full freestanding cabinet um, position in that regard. So talk a little bit about these czar positions and if you can and know uh, in the issue of climate change and uh, former Secretary Kerry's role? Um, I'll take a stab at it. Um, I was just going to say in my overview and, and looking at the initial staffs and um, the czars, what you often find is that they are often to reward key constituencies or key advocates that were lobbying throughout the campaign and pushing towards something. Um, so, for instance, President George W. Bush created the White House Office of Faith-Based and Community Initiatives. Um, so sometimes they are seen as kind of a reward for sort of helping uh, the victory of the incoming president. Um, in this case, it's very clear that climate change was an important issue in the Democratic nomination process. He's probably getting a lot of pressure from some of the more progressive wing of the party um, to create that position. Uh, and I would also note that I, in addition to the Kerry position, they are apparently putting climate change experts or small czars in each of the departments across the federal government to see, to do whatever they can in regard to climate change for each specific department, which is definitely a new innovation in staffing. Chris, Dave, as you've watched this, do you have particular observations on this point, how, how one creates a team around a topic that, uh, that doesn't have obvious silos to address it? I guess I'll go back to a comment I made earlier, which is um, I don't know if we were starting the federal government again from scratch, we would have necessarily siloed the agencies the way they are siloed. But given the uh, the nature of some of these problems that you face, whether it's on a domestic basis or on a uh, international basis, you have to work consciously to break down those silos. And so, you know, what people sometimes nefariously call czars. I just call people who are coordinating processes. And if you look on something like climate change, it is important in my mind for somebody of the stature of a John Kerry to be leading the international efforts. Now, Eric can talk better about what it means to have a big personality like that in the State Department where his former deputy is now his boss. But on the domestic side, you know, I think when people who don't know government well think of climate change, they think, well, you know, maybe that's just EPA. But it really spans a dozen different agencies from transportation to uh, interior to agriculture to commerce, because that's where NOAA sits in. Uh, and so it is trying to bring together all the different funding streams, the enforcement mm -hmm. powers, the regulatory powers in a coherent way. And I think as the nature of the problems that government faces gets bigger and more multifaceted, it's why you've seen these proliferation of czars. I, I largely agree with uh, what Chris just said, Bill. Uh, you know, uh, the the work of government, and particularly in the national security sphere, has grown uh, so much uh, over the last fifty years that r really it's more than a president can handle. It's one of the reasons why I think the role of vice presidents has 
uh, grown uh, so much since the 1970s. Um, it, it's more than a Secretary of State can handle, which is why I think the Deputy Secretary positions are are so important. Same with same with Defense. Um, I do think um, that Chris has put his finger on what I believe will be a major management challenge for both Tony Blinken and Jake Sullivan, which is uh, you've got um, a former cabinet secretary, longtime United States senator, former presidential candidate, who whose deputy is now nominally his boss, as Chris said, uh, and who is meant to coordinate with a uh, 40, uh, uh, four year old uh, national security advisor. Um, this is also someone who has had a penchant for um, freelancing when he was a member of the Senate on, you know, on international negotiations. And, uh, you know, is he really going to be able to, you know, withstand the um, temptation uh, when he's out doing climate work to say, you know, I saw my friend Javad Zarif uh, you know, uh, in Paris while we were talking about climate. I just had a sidebar conversation with him about the Iran nuclear deal, you know. Uh, I'll fill you in when I get home. I mean, you can imagine that this could become, uh, you know, a major problem. So it, it will have to see how self-disciplined, uh, you know, Secretary Kerry is in this new role uh, and how it all works. But, you know, in the past, I would say, uh, and you know, David can correct me if, if he thinks I'm misstating the history here, but uh, I'd say there've been more mishaps with these kinds of arrangements than not. Hmm. Uh, and so it's one of the areas I'll be looking at to see you know, how they manage. Dave, as you're watching it, are there things jumping out at you? you? You studied this for a year, you talked to all these other folks out there, you started meeting with the Biden team early on as soon as the transition was formed which was in the summer, right around the time of the convention after they had secured the nomination, actually secured it quite early. Um, did you have a certain set of expectations about what they might do? And have you been surprised either at them sticking with the plan that you thought or going in a different direction than you thought? So I'm not surprised, and, you know, and Chris knows these folks well. So we started working with all of the candidates in the Democratic primary in January. And basically our message then was, if you're still standing in March, that's when you need to start to organize. By March, there were two candidates, Vice President Biden and Senator Sanders. They both were very focused. Biden happened to have, well, one of the things we did is we gave the campaigns a job description for a transition chair. And that job description went something like this someone who is known by and trusted by the candidate. People, you know, John Podesta by Barack Obama, Dick Cheney by George Bush, uh, Chris Christie obviously had some problems. Someone who, is, who knows the government. Um, someone who is a planner and effectively organized. And someone who is above ambition. They're not positioning for themselves. And Biden, picked Ted Kaufman, who had all those qualities and more. When Ted was in the Senate, he actually authored the amendments to the Presidential Transition Act. So Ted and a few other people started working on this very, very early and they put together a fantastic team. Jeff Zients, Johannes Abraham, Avril Haines. Um, you know, Chris can talk about this, but basically in the Obama transition, you had Podesta and Chris and two or three other people who I think most people would consider senior. And otherwise it was a bunch of junior people. Biden has layers and layers of senior people with experience in the transition. And they've been ruthlessly organizing to be ready on day one since early March. And so I'm not surprised at what I've seen. I'm looking forward to the history being written. And again, I think the history today says that the best transition ever was Bush to Obama, both because the Bush administration laid out the red carpet for whomever won, and because the Obama transition team under John Podesta and Chris Liu was so good. Mike Froman did a great job with the personnel, um, Lisa Brown on agency review, they just had a great team. Biden, I think is gonna nudge ahead of Chris. I don't know if Chris is gonna lunge through the Zoom at me and strangle me, or if he's gonna get a little teary eyed, or maybe he disagrees. 
But I think the Biden team, they're, they're really buttoned up. And let me just, just reflect on the data. So Katie Tempest has done just great analysis. The data is so important. Getting people in their seats is critical. So Bush 43 had the best first year ever of any transition. The Obama team started faster, but there are a bunch of issues that slowed them down mid-year. By the end of the first year, Bush had 521 Senate confirmed people in their seats out of 1250. So even the best ever, they were still less than, you know, they were about 40% of filling the government. And so getting those people in their seats quickly at a time of an economic crisis, a health crisis, a racial justice crisis and a political crisis is really important. Biden's organized, they're naming people at a faster pace. Hopefully the Senate will move forward quickly. And then also the non-Senate confirmed positions are really important to get a lot of senior people into the jobs quickly that are not Senate confirmed. And I'm hoping the Biden team does that as well. I just have to respond to Dave and I will, I will 100% agree with him. Um, I guess my analogy is this, you know how in diving you get scored on two things. You get scored on the execution and then you get scored on the degree of difficulty. The degree of difficulty in which the Biden team is executing this transition is unlike anything we had to deal with. We could not have asked for a better partner in, in the Bush administration. Um, I've actually gotten tired, but I, I show this letter all the time. This is the GSA ascertainment letter from 2008. This was delivered two hours after the election was called by the networks. Uh, we were in the transition office 9 a.m. after election day. Um, twice a day, I did a phone call with the deputy chief of staff of the White House, Blake Gottesman, where we walked through problems uh, that were happening. We, we stopped doing the calls after a week because we had no problems because everything was going swimmingly. It, uh, uh, and, and, and so the obstacles and the hurdles that the Biden people are going through um, history will write about this. I mean, it, this is this is significant. And certainly, the the foremost seems to be uncooperative Trump. But you also have the pandemic, so most of this work is being done by Zoom. Yeah. Uh, I had one and, thing, Bill. Just to, and then you have the pandemic as a crisis to manage, as well exactly. as an economic crisis. Dave, yeah. Uh, but after throwing Chris under the bus a little, <laughs> the Biden people have the benefit of a couple things. One is. When Chris started his job, I know this because I studied what Chris did. He went to Jim Johnson's house and Jim Johnson went to his closet and grabbed a box and said, here you go. That was the experience that Chris had the benefit of. Since then, there's been two amendments to the law. Organizations like the Partnership and Katie's Great Work and the Miller Center have documented transitions, lessons learned. The Miller Center did this great book you know, on first years and a whole project on that. The development of, of transition as an institution has changed since Chris Liu ran it, and the Biden team has benefited from that. And that's good for the country. And so, you know, they benefited from Romney's experience. They benefited from Bush's experience, the good and the bad, the, the, the shortened transition. Um, and so, you know, they're building on the foundations of others, but they're also wickedly organized. But, but let me ask you one question, Dave, and I think this goes to everybody else. We've got about six, seven minutes left before the next panel. The one thing that is different about this, not just since the recent administrations, but I think it's my understanding that this is the first time that a newly elected Democratic president, his party has not controlled both houses of Congress since the 1800s. And so we talk about the confirmation challenge of getting people confirmed. I, you know, it's still possible they could win the two Senate seats in Georgia, but even there, it's a 50-50 house where Kamala Harris is going to have to live in her Senate office to break ties on a daily basis. Um, what What is this going to be like? What can we expect in this space where apparently every single challenge will have to run through Congress. And currently, Republicans in Congress, I think only 20 of over 200 House and Senate Republicans have acknowledged Joe Biden as the vice president-elect, even if their own party at the state and local level and at the federal judge level is acknowledging him. So what, what are we looking for? What are we, what are we looking at here? 
It well, could be a rough ride. I mean, for as, as prepared as the Biden administration is with given all the experience, et cetera. I mean, if it's a Republican majority in the Senate, there's going to be a lot more scrutiny of every nominee, uh, even ones that you think should skate through. Uh, it, it's just a more, more polarized era and it's going to be more complicated. Um, there's going to be more oversight uh, on and on. It's just, I think it'll be, there'll be a slower pace of confirmations and it's just going to be a rockier ride. They're going to have to be careful and make as few missteps as possible to try to take advantage of that early honeymoon period. Uh, you know, I, <clears throat> I can't speak on the domestic side, but for the national security nominees, I think, you know, there is a disposition on the part of Majority Leader McConnell, if he remains Majority Leader, uh, you know, to work with um, a president like Biden on on nominees. Uh, they have a, a relationship, of course, that goes back to their years in the Senate together. Um, but I don't think anyone should underestimate how hard a job. Um, McConnell is going to have. It was easy for him to maintain unity in the Republican conference in the Senate when they had a Republican president. It's going to be a lot harder uh, now when you have a very large number of senators who clearly are um, have presidential ambitions of their own and want to run in what John Bolton calls the Trump lane. Um, and uh, that is going to be a real problem for McConnell to manage. And I, I, you know, there needs to be some recognition, I think, that you know, the two sides have to work together uh, to, make, you know, to make this work. If you end up with the, you know, the system or the situation that you outlined, Bill, where the Democrats win both seats in Georgia and it's a tie Senate, I had to live with that for four months with Dick Cheney, where you know, he had to sit there uh, because he might have to, you know, vote at any any given moment until Jim Jeffords walked across the aisle and changed the complexion of the Senate briefly, um, and that's not easy. I mean, I, I can tell you that's a very hard uh, situation to manage for a White House. It is. I went back and looked. The last time an incoming president faced a Senate of the opposing party was um, George H. W. Bush in nineteen um, uh, nineteen eighty nine. Uh, what is interesting, if you go back and look at the roll call votes of cabinet members, every single one got confirmed almost unanimously. One person failed. That was John Tower, but that was ancient history. That was a bunch of other things. His replacement, Dick Cheney, was confirmed unanimously. And it, it is impossible to think uh, that anything comparable to that could happen. But that was you know, the U.S. Senate 30 years ago. Um, it would be wonderful to see it again, but I'm pretty skeptical about that. Yeah, recent Republican presidents, I should have said, have faced uh, at least one House of Congress controlled by Democrats. Yeah. But I, I think it goes back to the 1800s when a Democrat was elected yeah. and didn't control both houses. Dave, your own thoughts on this? You're, I'm sure watching this very carefully, and the partnership has been so good at it, tracking appointments uh, along with the Washington Post. Tell, tell us what you're thinking in this regard. We care about this a lot. Under Trump, we advocated to get people in their seats. These positions are there for a reason and you want them filled. And so I'm hopeful that the exig exigencies of this situation, the economic crisis, the health crisis, the national security crises we face, plus the fact that Biden is appointing really competent, experienced people, you know, for, for Eric Edelman to compliment the national security team, this is, you know, a guy that worked for Dick Cheney for many years and was his one of his trusted confidants. That shows twice. you twice. <laughs> you know, Biden's appointing very, very highly competent people with great experience and the ability to work across the aisle. There will be a couple of controversial nominees that are always are, but the data shows, and Katie's you know done wonderful work on this, the data shows the number of, of uh, nominations that actually fail is very, very small. In George Bush's eight years there were only four failed nominations, truly failed nominations. Um, we've got time for one more question. I'm gonna to go to the question that's sitting at the top of the box. I've been staring at it for some time. Uh, one uh, 30 second answer from each of you. To what extent is running the modern White House similar to that of the episodes of the 90s TV series, The West Wing, um, which I only belatedly started watching. And my daughters will pay careful attention to this answer because they've also started watching. Bill, 
I've always thought of you of the, as the Rob Lowe of presidential historians. Oh God, please don't <laughs> tell my wife that. <laughs> Uh, I'll give two observations. It, it is the um, weightiness of the decisions uh, in the West Wing with all of the insecurities of Veep. Uh, and the second thing I will say is that you, if, you're, if you've ever been in the West Wing, uh, you're not walking and talking because the hallways are not wide enough to walk and talk. Mm -hmm. That's my answer. Yeah. I will just add that one time I was at a, a chief of staff's conference and Dick Cheney said, somebody asked him a similar question. It was in the heyday of the West Wing. And Dick Cheney said, it's a little bit like going to the Epcot Center to see the world. <laughs> so you know how at Epcot they have like every country. Uh, and then he went on to sort of elaborate that it's actually, the pace is just, you know, times 10 what it seems like on the television show. And having never worked there, but just interviewed a lot of people who talk over and over again about the 80 hour weeks, saying goodnight to their child on Sunday night and saying, I'll see you on Friday night, even though they're in town, um, the, the pace is, Really crazy. It's growing. Eric, to close with you. Well, you know, um, I have to confess, I've only watched a handful of episodes of West Wing. My wife has seen much more than I have. And it made me feel, I think, like a police officer, because I'm sure police officers who watch, you know, Hill Street Blues and uh, NYPD Blue, uh, you know, say, well, it's not like that. And, you know, I, the episodes I watched just made me feel that way. Uh, but I do agree with Chris. Um, you know, and not just because I worked in OVP, at least in recent years, I've had the sense that, you know, I was living inside a Veep episode. <laughs> well, um, thanks to you all and thanks to the audience for, uh, for the great set of questions. We're, we're really thrilled to have our Miller Center team plus our honorary teammate, Dave Marchick with us today. We, there's, there's so much expertise on the presidency in Washington, around the world, but at the Miller Center, particularly on transitions, we, we really do have a dream team. So thank you all. Um, so turning to our next panel, um, we're now moving to discussing a phenomenal and timely new book, The Man Who Ran Washington, written by two of the most accomplished and talented journalists of our time, Peter Baker and Susan Glasser. But before we get to Peter and Susan, just a couple words of context, and then I'll introduce them and uh, my colleague and their moderator, Mary Kate Perry. So James A. Baker III, Princeton, the US Marine Corps, University of Texas Law, Law School, major law firm in Houston, but maybe his most important credential and the one people most know him for was as George H.W. Bush's Secretary of State. And maybe because of that, and one of the reasons he got that was that he was George Bush's tennis partner for years and years. But he is also largely considered the most effective chief of staff in White House history. And as we heard in the last panel, and I didn't know these were in my remarks, that was on behalf of the president that George H.W. Bush had hoped to defeat and prevent from being president, Ronald Reagan. Um, that's why the combination of Peter and Susan to write this book is also a dream team. We'll be talking about somebody who served as White House Chief of Staff and as uh, Secretary of State. Peter is the Chief White House Correspondent for the New York Times and a political analyst for MSNBC and the author of two other books that he's written, including On President. Susan is staff writer for The New Yorker where she has been writing a weekly column on the Trump presidency which is required reading for all of us that follow the presidency. Uh, she's also a CNN global affairs analyst and has worked at many of the leading news outlets in Washington before her current appointment. And we're thrilled to not just have them with us to discuss this great book, but to have the conversation moderated by our own Mary Kate Perry, who is a senior fellow at the Miller Center and also teaches in the College of Arts and Sciences. Mary Kate was a speechwriter for George H.W. Bush. Um, and before that, maybe her most important credential was a graduate of the University of Virginia uh, and a near classmate of mine. Um, <laughs> uh, in her capacity in working for George H.W. Bush, he wrote over a hundred of his speeches. She's ghostwritten numerous books, writes speeches, uh, has run podcasts, and uh, fortunately for us is a regular presence on the Miller Center webinar series. So. Mary-Kate, over to you and Peter and Susan, and thank you all for being with us today. 
Uh, thanks, Phil. And um, I'd like to welcome our husband and wife team, Peter Baker and Susan Glasser, authors of The Man Who Ran Washington, my dog-eared copy. I've read every page of it. And so uh, uh, thank you for joining us today and, and coming back to the Miller Center. The, the uh, fact that you came back, we really appreciate it. <laughs> well, um, and uh, since our audience just sat through uh, a previous webinar, I'd like to point out that it is five o'clock. If anybody needs to get a happy hour cocktail, uh, my, my recommendation would be the historically accurate Grey Goose Martini, which is what James Baker, as you guys would know, uh, used to smuggle into George Bush's hospital room. Uh, and I would, uh, I would like to ceremoniously rename that cocktail the Velvet Hammer in his, uh, in his honor. That was the name of the, the prologue of your book. And um, uh, you know, when, when George Bush died, I got asked uh, as part of the funeral coverage, uh, we had a little contest going of all the commentators of how many of George Bush's former nicknames we could remember. And, and I thought it was one of the great things about your book is how many of Baker's nicknames <laughs> you guys unearthed. One being the Velvet Hammer, which was the one his, uh, his cousin came up with and then it made the cover of Time Magazine. Uh, Miracle Man during the 76 campaign the fencing master, his secret service code name, uh, Mr. Caution from his uh, staff, Mr. Invisible from uh, Mrs. Bush during the 92 campaign. But I do think Velvet Hammer is the best. I'm glad you guys led the book off with that. <laughs> um, so so as, uh, as Bill just said, your book covers the lives and times of the man who served in senior positions for four different presidents, chaired five different presidential campaigns, served as White House Chief of Staff for two different presidents, served as Secretary of Treasury and Secretary of State, was offered Secretary of Defense, also almost became NSC advisor, considered becoming Attorney General and Director of the CIA, and most importantly, uh, to some people, at one point was one of two candidates to be commissioner of the uh, Major League Baseball. <laughs> so he could have been the commish, but um, I thought since uh, since this was kind of a heavy uh, heavy discussion we just got out of, I thought before we get to all the things we can learn from James Baker, uh, because I think there's plenty of people of all ages on this webinar uh, curious, what can we learn from George uh, uh, Jim Baker? I thought I'd start with sort of a lightning round. Three interesting things that we did not know that are in your book. First interesting thing, his favorite White House lunch tuna fish on toast with a glass of buttermilk. No. <laughs> Any comments there? How did you find that out? Well, you know, first of all, thank you for having us. Thank you uh, to Bill and Mary Kay Carey. We're thrilled to be with the Miller Center. The Miller Center was key, I would say, to doing this book because you guys have such a fantastic resource oh, good. of oral histories that we mined ruthlessly and relentlessly because it's, it's really a gold mine for any historian who cares about the presidency. So I just want to say that at the outset, and you'll see in our footnotes time and again. Oh, 65 pages of, of footnotes, very well documented book. It was amazing. Well, you don't have yeah. to look at the footnotes, but if you do look at the footnotes, you'll <laughs> see the North Center is throughout there. But yeah, well, I think that, I'm not sure if the tuna fish and buttermilk is the key to success or- Yeah, or just a side note, a little gem. I think he still eats uh, tuna fish for lunch. When, we, when he took us to the famous Houston Country Club, which is where he uh, famously teamed up with George Herbert Walker Bush to be tennis partners. And as he will show you, won many both doubles and yep. single titles on the tennis courts. Uh, we went to lunch with him. He did eat tuna fish yeah. at that lunch. But not buttermilk. The buttermilk is what's so jaw dropping. I, I don't think that's an, on the a la carte menu anywhere. <laughs> I, I think he's a creature of habit is what yeah. it really is. Exactly. You know? He always wore the green ties, for instance. Every day yes. it was a green tie. And so I think he's a creature of habit. Uh, okay, interesting point number two, another little gem before we get to the big stuff. Uh, he did not use email and has never looked at Twitter. Yeah. Uh, for years, didn't have a TV at his ranch in Wyoming. Do you think that is still true? Do you think he still does not use email and Twitter? It is still true. It's definitely yeah. still true. Uh, he, his wow. wife uh, is on email and you know handles the family correspondence and he still goes to work at Baker Botts, the, the law firm that was founded in part by his family. And obviously, you know, he has assistants there who have email, but, um, you know, he was, I guess it was Colin Powell, uh, you know, who was the last secretary of state to be in the sort of semi pre-digital uh, yeah. world. Yeah. But the interesting thing about Baker though, that we found 
is that he even uh, well into his 80s uh, is a consummate information gatherer and gossip. He wants to know everything about uh, the people around him. That was definitely one of the secrets of his success. I think in Washington, uh, he had a very um, you know, keen sense for an understanding how much those, you know, people stories and what's happening backstairs really matter. So he might not have been, uh, you know, lurking on Twitter, but he, uh, he has a keen ear even now for uh, what, what's the gossip well, and what I, matters. I would say the other key to success is not leaving a trail uh, on paper. Yes, <laughs> so yeah, you don't have, you don't have the email, you don't have to worry about what might be subpoenaed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. As you say in the book, he's very proud of leaving uh, Washington unindicted, and right. an email might have, uh, you know, helped with that. <laughs> right, exactly. So, uh, so the third thing is that behind the scenes. So I'm one of those types. You know, over the years, I did various projects for him, and everybody in my world called him Mr. Baker. Uh, I, I feel very uncomfortable even calling him James Baker, much less Jim Baker. Yeah. But, um, but for the purposes of this interview, I will try and call him James Baker. Uh, uh, and behind the scenes. Uh, people my age all called him J-A-B-3. Uh, we would never say that to him, but you know, if you were in a memo or something, you'd call him J-A-B-3. And I was shocked to find out that he's really J-A-B-4. You know, right? So uh, can you tell us about that? How did he, how did that happen? <laughs> well, what's hilarious about that, so he is James Addison Baker III, uh, as you said, uh, but he's the fourth James Addison Baker. And, you know, we asked repeatedly, as you might imagine, in seven years, we're embarrassed to say we didn't get any farther than the Pat explanation in his family, which essentially, well, we can't count that well. Uh, <laughs> basically, you know, you had a, you, you had a junior who, who uh, dropped the junior, dropped the junior. Yeah, right, right. Uh, that essentially is what happened. But it goes all the way back to the first James Addison Baker, who was the family ancestor, the great grandfather, of this James Addison Baker who came from Huntsville, Alabama to Huntsville, Texas, right really within uh, years of its founding uh, as a trading post. Uh, and uh, that James Addison Baker became friends with Sam Houston, who also was based in Huntsville, Texas before he went on to found Houston and have the city named after him. Uh, and he was also a lawyer and became ultimately one of the co-founders of Baker Boss, the law firm that this James Baker still works at today. So you can sort of see the burden of the family legacy and the family name in that. Uh, but yeah, it's very confusing. And by the way, there's more. There are, a, there was a James Well, his son Baker. is James Baker the fourth. Right. He's known as Jamie. And then Jamie, right. Jamie did not, Jamie only had girls. He didn't have a boy. The younger son, Doug, had a boy. Who's then, named James who's Baker? Who's named James A. Baker? But I think he's the second. They, they, they decided to right. it's, re. It's, I don't know. It's, it's even more crazy. You on your toes. Yeah. Like in Hollywood movies, suddenly the sequel is this you know, a prequel. And who can, who can yes, yes, yes. Star Wars. Not yeah. all the Star Wars movies in a row, then you can somehow. <laughs> right. So the fourth really one. So, so when you think about what can we learn from his life um, and his ability to get things done. I think it would be worth giving just a quick paragraph or two on what did he learn from these three characters? You, you mentioned one of them, the judge, the captain, and the warden. What yeah. did he learn from those three characters and, and who were they? Well, exactly. So the judge was the great grandfather, right? He was a, briefly a judge in Texas before losing his position because of the Civil War. Obviously the Confederates weren't allowed to keep their jobs uh, when they lost. Uh, and was bitter about that and basically set the family tone of we don't do politics in this. Politics is ugly. So this family motto was work hard, study, but keep out of politics. And the, the successive generations were taught that going down all the way to our James Baker that we're talking about here. The captain was our James Baker's grandfather, the judge's son. He really was one of the most powerful, most important men in Houston, helped build up the modern institutions of that city and was kind of a legend. I mean, Rice University was a was really a creation of Captain Baker. Now, mind you, he was never actually a captain. He was a he was an honorary, you know, honor guard, ceremonial kind of thing, and they gave him the title of captain. He never fought anything, but his son, who was R. James Baker's father, did. He was fought, uh, captain in World War One, but didn't get the title of captain within the family. He was called more ironically the warden by his son, our future Secretary of State, and his son's friends. And you can imagine why. Warden was a tough nut. 
He would throw cold water on Jim, Jimmy Baker when he didn't get up early enough on a Saturday, when Jimmy got in trouble with his friends and got, you know, uh, uh, pulled to, into a jailhouse by the police for some hooliganism. All the other kids' fathers came and bailed him out. Not the warden. He let Jimmy Baker spend the night in jail so he would learn a lesson from it. So he was a tough nut. And I think that's uh, his his influence was really powerful on uh, our future Secretary of State, our, our subject today. You know, one of the rules that that James Baker the third lived by, uh, it seems, was the five P's. Uh, can you tell us quick what the uh, five P's were? Yes, uh, even our son, uh, having worked on this uh, book for a long time, can recite this. Uh, oh, this is good. This is good. Prior, prior preparation prevents poor performance right. uh, was uh, another one of the endless family mottos. And certainly uh, it, it, it was one of the keys to Baker's success, although perhaps inflated in the sense that, uh, you know, there's certainly plenty of people who are workaholics who know their brief in Washington. Uh, that's not unique or specific to him. Uh, but it tells you also about, I think, the burden of family expectation that Baker mm -hmm. came to uh, uh, Washington with. Uh, in many ways, uh, again, politics was something that was uh, almost a rebellion for Jim Baker and a late in life uh, career switch. He was not even until his mid 40s that he came here to Washington in 1975. But I think this family that we're talking about, it's not irrelevant either. And that was one of the big takeaways for Peter and I'm working on this book is that, you know, Jim Baker's dazzling, you know, kind of career is, is pretty well known. The fact that he was both Reagan's White House chief of staff and also Secretary of State when the Cold War ended. Again, something that we started out being familiar with. But to what extent did that uh, sort of family legacy shape his ability to navigate and dominate uh, in Washington of the 1980s and 1990s? That prior preparation mantra and also all those James Addison Bakers before him. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, by the way, the dad was not just the warden. It wasn't just that he was a tough guy. He was an extreme micromanager, as has his, his father before him, uh, the judge, sorry, the, the captain Baker was also, uh, you know, micromanaged the warden who in turn then micromanaged Jim Baker to such an extreme degree. Uh, this is a family that took itself very seriously. It's placed in Houston. Uh, Jim Baker was told even uh, what law school he should go to by his father. He had gone to Princeton. He wanted maybe to, to go to law school in East Coast, say, go to Harvard, something like that. No, no, you're going to practice law in Texas. You have to go to the University of Texas uh, Law School. Not only that, he forced his son to pledge an undergraduate fraternity when he was, was already in law school. He was a, he was, he had been in the Marines. He was married. He had a kid and he's subjecting himself to pretty out of control hazing in yeah. the 1950s uh, because his father ordered him to do so. So I bring that up because, uh, you know, and again, in a way, it suggests uh, the kind of discipline that somebody who grew up uh, in a family like that mm -hmm. took into anything that he did professionally, but also the extent to which it really is kind of amazing that he, an accidental, that he even ended up here in, in Washington and in politics in the first place. Yeah, speaking speaking of his family and that that pivot to politics, um, one of the things that I had never seen, I think anybody had ever seen, uh, in the book is the the letter that you have from from uh, James Baker to George Bush, his friend at the time, uh, neither one in politics yet, uh, about his wife's diagnosis of cancer, his first wife, who was the mother of the three boys, and if you could uh, tell us why that was such a interesting letter and why why no one had ever seen it before. I think that's a fascinating part of this story. It is, and I think it's, one of the things that's really interesting is it tells you how history sometimes turns on random events, right? The random event that Jim Baker becomes friends with George Bush and the tennis courts of the Houston Country Club because they're both fiercely competitive and they both wanted to win. And they both to the end of their lives would tell you about the two doubles tournaments that they won together back in the, uh, in the 60s. And by the time, uh, you know, 1969, 1970 rolls around and Jim Baker's wife, Mary Stewart, is diagnosed with cancer and, and Jim Baker is told that it's terminal and he doesn't share this with his wife and he doesn't share this with his kids and he doesn't share this with his mother. The only person he shares this with is George Bush, his friend, George H.W. Bush. And he writes him a letter and this is the letters in the book. And he explains to George why he can't, George's point is thinking about running for Senate. He's in the House at the time. And George is trying to get Jim to go into politics, which he had never done. And 
Baker is intrigued. He's kind of restless as a Texas lawyer. He says to George, I can't do it. Mary Stewart's uh, diagnosis is terminal. She doesn't know that. I, you know, I've got to be with her and these, make these last months as, as, as good as they possibly can for her. Now, of course, she did know, right? What wife doesn't know? This is back in the 70s, the Mad Men era. Maybe husbands and wives didn't talk to each other the same way they do today. She knew. And she left him a letter, of course, too. She left it for him to find after she passed. And the letter, which is also in the book and also a tearjerker, uh, is, is brought to him by her good friend, Susan Garrett, who says, hey, Mary Stewart left you this letter. And he, to, the, to this day, even in his 80s, when we talked about this with him, when he read this letter uh, with us, he would tear up. You know, 50 years later, it was still so powerful for him. And, and, and it tells you something about his life. And it's after this terrible event that George Bush says to him, come work for me on the Senate campaign. Come deal with your grief by getting into politics. And boom, just like that history changes. Yeah, it was it was pretty remarkable. And, and by the way, uh, within a short period of time, the two of them start dating, uh, Susan Garrett, and elope. And not Jim and George, not Jim and George, but yeah, Jim. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, yes, not Jim and George. <laughs> Susan Garrett and Jim Baker. And, right. And elope and don't tell the the combined seven kids until after they've eloped. <laughs> that was you know, that was one of the most um, I think amazing things to us. You know, again, we were familiar with the public Jim Baker, uh, but not at all with this private. Uh, uh, That's what was drama, so yeah. drama. This was basically the Brady Bunch. If it was the Brady Bunch from hell, uh, and you know <laughs> oh, they had, they yeah. had four young yeah. sons and. His second wife, Susan, had three children, uh, and then they ultimately also had another child, so they had eight children all together. Uh, at one point, I think she said there were four children in middle school all at the same time. Oh, my Not gosh. a pleasant thing for any parent. Uh, mm -hmm. And this is right when Baker is beginning his public career. It's when he's beginning his career in Washington, and uh, he's not there for that, you know, kind of complicated, broken family. They're all living in this house uh, that his his poor, you know, dead wife had built to be her dream house. It wasn't big yeah. enough for them. They had children actually sleeping on the landing for a while. Oh until, my gosh. Until they could renovate the house. And, you know, again, this might seem far afield from the topic of, uh, you know, what does it take uh, to run uh, and dominate national politics? But I think it, it speaks to, uh, you know, a moment in time and, you know, certainly to the kind of white male privilege, you know, that Baker took it as his, you know, sort of uh, right, you know, I mean, it was Susan Baker who understandably broke into tears when she discovered by overhearing a conversation on election night, 1980, that Jim Baker was going to be the White House chief of staff for Ronald Reagan, who hadn't told her. She heard them talking about it at the election night victory party at the Century City Plaza in Los Angeles. And why did she burst into tears? Because she knew she was going to have to once again deal with this three-wing circus of this this eight children family. Well, I mean, I, I thought it was just fascinating because he's a very private person, and that's what was so amazing that that you were able to to get to some of that material. Um, so, so let's talk about. So his wife dies. He pivots to politics. He now starts basically a second career. He had a very successful career as a Houston lawyer. And he goes from running his friend George Bush's unsuccessful Senate campaign in 1970. And within five years, he is managing Ford's presidential campaign. And five years after that, he is Reagan's White House chief of staff. It's, it's a remarkable, you know, A to B to C. Uh, and, and what do you attribute that to? What are the job skills? The, the, what was it that got him that far that fast? It's really pretty remarkable. Well, it, it, it is a marriage of man and moment, right? Or person and moment. And basically the opportunity was there. The entire, you know, an entire generation of up and coming Republican operatives had been wiped out by Watergate. And suddenly there was this vacuum of leadership in the party that needed new blood. And Jim Baker had been brought to Washington by George Bush to, for a position at the Commerce Department. And the Commerce Secretary who moved to the White House and then to the campaign brings him along and says, hey, he's pretty impressive. And then a car accident kills uh, a longtime Ford advisor. And suddenly they say, well, how about this Baker guy to be the delegate hunter at the convention? So part of it's opportunity. And then part of it, of course, is then impressing people when you have that opportunity. And what Baker did was very intuitively figure out how to 
beat back Ronald Reagan's campaign against Gerald Ford for the nomination, which was no small thing. That was a huge challenge. Reagan had the, 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 the heart of the party was really with him. Uh, but Ford was the incumbent and, and Baker helps wrestle the, uh, the delegates at the convention in Kansas City in 1976, uh, wins the nomination. At that point, Ford says, well, hey, why don't you be the chairman for the fall as well? And so one thing leads to another, I think, you know, success begets success. Mm -hmm. Got the nickname. You talk about nicknames. One of the nicknames was the Miracle Man they gave him at that 1976 convention on the walkie talkies. That's how they referred to him as they were talking on the floor and it got in the New York Times. And so he did have this reputation of a miracle man. He, he nearly takes Ford back from the 33 point deficit in the general election against Carter. They fall short, but imagine making back 30 some points. So he came away even from a loss with the veneer, the aura of a winner. And I think he uh, perpetuated that throughout his career. So, so now he's gotten to Reagan's chief of staff, as we said, five years after being miracle man. Um, and I remember uh, him saying to me once, that he thinks all presidents are measured by how much they accomplish legislatively. What can they get over the finish line? And uh, certainly that, that first term of the Reagan administration when he was chief of staff and, and the second term when he was secretary of treasury, uh, he accomplished an incredible amount uh, of legislative uh, bipartisan landmark legislation hitting through. How, how do you think he did that? What was it that he was able to do that others were not? Well, you know, I'm glad we brought that up, Mary Kay, because I do think that this is the area where there's such a sharp contrast, obviously, with the Washington of today. And yeah. it, you know, our politics were part very partisan and acrimonious then as well. Uh, you know, again, the Republicans were ripping each other apart at the 76 convention over Reagan. Uh, you, you know, obviously, Baker was involved in many contentious campaigns. We'll talk about 88, I'm sure. And uh, you know, the Bush campaign against Dukakis, but when it came to governing, they had a philosophy really that, you know, that when the politics stopped, that's when the real business was going to be at hand. And also the idea that uh, it was requirement of the office to do something in it, uh, that permanent campaigning mm -hmm. uh, wasn't going to work. So you could say that it was about incentives, but certainly Baker was an extreme practitioner of deal making. I mean, I think that is where, to a certain extent, his corporate law background came into play, uh, his innate abilities. Uh, we found him in the dozens and dozens of hours we spent with him, uh, you know, in his mid to late 80s. We just found that that was his natural um, skill set and comfort zone. And that's what animated and excited him was the prospect of making a deal, any deal. Uh, and so that worked yeah. later with Soviets uh, uh, and uh, uh, Germans uh, when it came to the end of the Cold War, but it also worked on Capitol Hill. So he was Reagan's expert, I would say, uh, and really understood uh, the Congress and how to make a deal on the Hill probably better than any other Republican official uh, in the 1980s, right? And that uh, right. was clearly something that he took out of being White House Chief of Staff. I think uh, he, his mastery of the press at that moment different era, certainly, uh, in terms of the, the press, right? He uh, was not a creature of the social media, uh, fragmented era, we, as you pointed out, he's not on Twitter, uh, but he was a master of the media of that moment uh, and understood its centrality uh, in achieving deals. And the other thing that struck me as a through line between him in politics, uh, campaigning, and in governing and making these deals was a willingness to be strategic and to be disciplined about what you were doing, what you weren't doing. Uh, Ronald Reagan may have campaigned on getting rid of the Department of Education, uh, but to Baker, that was a distraction. And he was very focused on what does it take uh, to make a deal on the economy, obviously, and taxes. Those are the two key things mm -hmm. that Ronald Reagan had campaigned on in the 1980 campaign against Jimmy Carter. And of course, it's why, in many ways, he won the presidency. The country was in crisis uh, when Reagan uh, came into office. And Baker understood that he wasn't, wasn't going to be reelected in 1984 if he just talked a lot. Uh, you know, uh, And so that's where I think the political imperatives lined up with the governing imperatives for for Baker. Yeah, you might you might not know this about me, but uh, I was on the 1988 campaign, and my job back then was to write what was called the line of the day, and it was a one page sheet that went out in case any of the 50 state chairmen got pulled onto the nightly news or Nightline back then, and um, and by the way, that job ended on election day 
because that was to your point that was considered campaigning and now we're going to govern and we don't we don't have a line of the day anymore once you you know become the elected official so but every morning i would get the the word from secretary baker of what's today's line of the day going to be and it would be the economy or the environment or education or whatever and then i would have to build it from there uh, and so when you wrote about him getting up every morning uh, on the 88 campaign and saying, okay, what's our story today? And he had this sort of lifelong effort to try and shape the news coverage in whatever job he was in, as well as being kind of master of the strategic le leak, which is a different issue than <laughs> trying to shape the coverage. Um, I, I do think you, you came many, many times the word leak uh, appears in the book. And, and you make it clear that there was really no one better in Washington than working the press in a good way. Um, but were you concerned as writers that he was gonna sort of work his magic on you? Or um, I would think that could, that could have been a problem. Well, we went in eyes open, obviously. We, yeah, we, yeah. We, we didn't cover him at the time, but we knew, of, we knew him, we knew of him. We talked to him over the years for, you know, when he was on the Iraq study group for various times. Uh, but we did not cover him, so we had not experienced it. You're right, we, we were a little wary of that. We, we, we talked right here with a, with a whole lot of reporters who had dealt with him, right? A lot of the giants of his era, you know, Tom Friedman, Andrea Mitchell, Hedrick Smith, all these reporters, Luke Cannon, David Hoffman. We tried to consult with them, and all of them told us pretty much the same story, which was, yeah, he's going to spin you, he's good at that, that he, the leaks were very effective. But you know what? He never lied to me. I heard that again. We heard that again and again and again. And all these reporters still respected him. You know, Steve Weissman told these great stories, all these people. And they um, they came away feeling that he had dealt with them as grownups, as professionals, with respect. He returned mm -hmm. their phone calls. When he was mad at them, he was mad at them. So be it, they, you know, they, they would get past it. Uh, it wasn't personal. There was none of this enemies of the people stuff. Uh, so yeah, our, in this case, the book was not an authorized book. He had no control over the book, but he did cooperate with it. And he did invite us in. And, and I'll say this before I wrap up this part. I, I, I was very impressed that he lived up to his side of the bargain. You know, he said at the beginning of this process, I'm, I'm an open book to you. I'll answer your questions. I'll make all of my archives available to you. Wow. You can use everything I tell you, except I don't want anything put in my mouth that insults anybody who's trying to avoid. He didn't want to be seen as being, you know, uh, uh, snippy toward anybody. But basically anything that we wanted, you know, to use, anything we wanted to ask, he never tried to put anything off limits. And that was for seven years. And there was a point where we thought like, and, 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 and by the way, all the bad stuff, he just, he just answered. He was undefensive for the most part. Just answer it. Uh, and it. At the very end, we debated whether to show them the book in advance or not. We decided we weren't going to because we want to be able to say to people, look, this is not his book. It's our book. He right. didn't see it in advance. But the book's publication got delayed, right? It was going to be in May, but because of COVID, it got delayed to September. But they had already printed the galleys. We debated, do we send him a galley? No, we're not going to do that. Well, guess what? He's Jim Baker. He got a copy of the galley and not from <laughs> us, right? He's got his own sources. And, and lo and behold, after a week or two- <laughs> well, we're not surprised by that, right? And then lo and, lo and behold, after a week or two, a, a message comes from his office. He's got some corrections for you. We're like, okay, here we go. All this time, seven years. And there's three pages of corrections. And to his credit, they're all factual stuff. Not one thing he took issue with in terms of interpretive stuff. He didn't argue with the negative stuff. He didn't argue that we listened to his opponents too much on this or that. He didn't say, take this out or that. Wow. They're, they're all things like, hey, I had a shotgun that day, not a rifle. Or so-and-so was on the phone, but so-and-so wasn't. All of them strictly factual, very, very uh, you know, honorable in the way he was dealing it. So I have to say we were very pleased by that. Wow, that's remarkable. Um, and, and real quick, did you guys set out seven years ago with a list of 200 people or did you, did the whole thing start snowballing? <laughs> you started out with 10 and then it grew or did you know from the start this was gonna be the magnum opus? Well, I, we definitely didn't intend to take seven years and that really of <laughs> course is a factor of the last four years and you know, many, yeah. many distractions. Um, but we did, we did see from the very beginning that there was a real possibility of making this a, a, a sort of a big book about Washington and how it works uh, or how it used to work, uh, as well as a book about Baker and a, and a sort of unique American life. Because, uh, you know, remember this was already uh, sort of the dim recesses now of the Obama era, but even then it was clear that, uh, you know, there was a sort of gridlock and dysfunction that, that went well beyond 
uh, what we had previously seen in Washington and already also a sense that that period of time from Watergate to the end of the Cold War when Jim Baker was at its heights was was in many ways already a closed book, uh, you know, that we were for better or for worse in a different uh, era in our national politics and in the world. And so that was kind of our original vision for the book is that we would, you know, have it be a story about how Washington works, or at least how it used to work. Uh, and not as an exercise in nostalgia, I should say, uh, you know, this is this is a case study in power, not a celebration of it. Uh, but, you know, so that was in our head already that that there was at least the opportunity to do kind of a big Washington book. And it seems to me there's a, a question from the, one of the uh, viewers that is, what is it that makes this book different than Baker's two books uh, that some people on here have read both books? And it sounds like that's the answer right there is uh, the 200 sources and seven years and all the things that you guys could say about him that he uh, wouldn't necessarily say about himself. And, and that's, uh, you know, a fascinating addition to the collection, I think. But well, in fact, actually, here's you'll like this. <laughs> One of our favorite parts yeah. of our book is about his book. Exactly, exactly. Oh. As somebody who's gone back, you know, you've studied all this. You went back and did all those great interviews for 41 on 41, and you know, you right. know what it's like to go back after the fact. And sometimes people will tell stories that they don't tell, you know, at the yeah. time. But yeah. Baker, of course, in writing his memoir, was still thinking about his own future. He was sort of toying the first one anyway. He was still toying with running for president, and, and therefore his memoir was a political document. Mm -hmm. And we went, up, we went up to our Princeton for his archives. The very first tip we got from an archivist up there, brilliant. He says, the first box you need to look at, look at the box for his own memoirs. Why? Why do we need to do that? Because in that box, you will find all things. First of all, he, he'll have collected all the things you need to tell his story. And, and it, there's a lot of interviews that he did with his ghostwriter, for instance, in there. But second of all, are all the stuff he decided not to put in the book. And there are all these memos in the boxes. Yeah. He's fighting with his staff over what not to put in the book. The staff wants him to put this in and put that in, and particularly Andrew Carpendale, who had been his uh, speechwriter yeah. at the State Department, a tragic story, end up dying later. He's like, Secretary, if you don't put this in, you're not telling the full story. And it didn't matter, Baker, he was a, you know, he cut things out, things about the Iraq war, other things he didn't want in there. And I think that tells you something to all that stuff that he didn't want in his book, literally, is in our book. Wow, that's a, that's a great story. Um, so let's let's pivot a little bit to uh, more about uh, Baker and Bush and Baker and and uh, Reagan. Um, at, at different times in the book, you say that Baker and Reagan are kind of alter egos to each other. There was a quote from Scowcroft where he says, you know, Reagan really did need a chief of staff. He wasn't that interested uh, much in the work of the president. So Baker was really almost like co-president because Baker took on all the day to day stuff that the president, President Reagan did not. Um, so we know sort of how they were different, but it, what can you say about how Baker and Reagan were similar? Well, you know, it's actually very interesting. I mean, obviously, uh, you know, there was a, a, an age gap between them. There was, you know, a, an ideological gap to a certain extent between them. You know, Baker was not only an outsider from the Bush establishment, meaning the party, but, uh, you know, just essentially a pragmatist was his approach to politics. Uh, and that was true in the Reagan era. and in the Bush era, and he—it's uh, not that he wasn't a conservative as a, a general principle, uh, you know, uh, but he wasn't a movement conservative. He wasn't a culture warrior. He didn't come out of the Reagan Revolution, uh, you know, he, which had been building, you know, since the Goldwater era. That—that that just wasn't uh, either Baker's milieu, and it wasn't his natural instinct uh, on politics. So that made it all the more remarkable, by the way, that Reagan. Uh, selected him as his chief of staff and, and continued with him. But they did have, I think, some personality traits in common. Uh, both of them were very successful uh, 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 in the world of other people, but fundamentally uh, were more introverted, were more, or at least grounded in their own selves. They're both Westerners and outdoors people. Uh, you know, Reagan obviously famously loved his ranch, horseback riding. But actually, that was really, and we found even today, this is true, Jim Baker. Uh, loves the outdoors. He's a famous hunter uh, and he's still doing that. In fact, uh, he came down with COVID this year, uh, uh, this fall when he was yeah, only at age 90 and lived. How yeah. did he live? Uh, but when we asked uh, a couple of weeks later after he was finally better, uh, how he was doing and what he was up to, the answer came back that he uh, was unavailable because he had gone off elk hunting on his ranch in Wyoming with his son. 
Uh, so, you know, yeah. I think that's something that, that Reagan and Baker had in common. Uh, and they were both also hard to get to know. The people who worked with them uh, were really there in a professional capacity. And uh, just as many of those who worked closely with yeah. Reagan described that, uh, Baker yeah. had people who worked with him for years. Uh, Bob Zellick, uh, you know, said that he, he didn't think that Baker even knew his wife's name. That's what you said, Mr. Baker, right? Yeah, He's not yeah Mr. Baker. Yeah. That's, right. That's right. Uh, so then, so a similar question, Baker and Bush, uh, Bob Gates said that Baker demanded more loyalty of the president than he gave in return, which sort of begs the question, who needed who more? Uh, would one have made it without the other, 41 and, and Mr. Baker? Uh, were they, was one gonna make it anyway if the other one hadn't been in his life or was it an equal relationship mutual or what do you think? Yeah, it's, it's clear obviously Baker wouldn't have been um... Uh, where he got to without Bush. And I think it's arguable that Bush wouldn't have gotten where he got to without Baker. I think Baker was really key to Bush's success in a lot of ways. And because the relationship was like brothers, that's the word both of them used with us when we interviewed them about each other. They both talked about each other as, as a brother. Well, brothers have sibling rivalries, so they, they can go up and down. And it, it, can be, it can be fraught at times with natural competition or stress. These are both competitive guys, right? Yeah. And there were times when, you know, Bush would get frustrated with Baker. So, well, if you're so smart, how come you're not president, right? And that's yeah. when Baker told us, okay, that's when I know I need to back off. That's where I've, 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 hit, I've hit my line and I need to, to back off. And there are moments clearly when Bush takes an action without consulting Baker, as in picking, for instance, Dan Quayle, as his running mate, as in picking Johnson Nunu as his chief of staff without mm -hmm. consulting Baker. And in some ways, those are, seem to be acts of rebellion to some extent. I don't have to ask Baker everything I do. I'm the president. And I, yeah. you, can, you can understand that sense of pride that he has. And, and on the same, on the flip side, I think that there are times that Baker was frustrated with Bush. He thought, well, I, I'm as good as this. I could be as, you know, he's not a good candidate after all. I have to tell him how to do this and that. You know, so I think all of that is true. All of those kinds of moments, the 1992 campaign, obviously being probably the sourest moment because Baker doesn't want to come back to run the reelect. And when he does, he's kind of, you know, only half-hearted about it, according to people. And there was some, you mentioned the Barbara Bush's phrase, the invisible man. She was unhappy that he seemed to be so absent from the campaign. But in the end, of course, like real brothers, you know, it, the foundation of the relationship is deeper and, and more uh, sustainable than anything that might pull it apart. And so who's there on the day that Bush dies? Who goes to his house in Houston three times on that day is Jim Baker. And who's sitting by his bed, literally rubbing Bush's feet as he passes away? That's Jim Baker. That's the nature, I think, of their relationship. Yeah, and, and coming full circle from George and Barbara Bush being the last ones to see Mary Stewart alive. Exactly. Uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting circle of their lives. And then think about it. You can't imagine that a president or secretary of state would that personally close. And that, of course, is going to also affect their power relationship and their ability to do things in politics. Yeah, yeah. So, so one of the questions um, is related to what I was going to ask you is, uh, what would James Baker say is his biggest accomplishment? What was his worst? And I don't think we're talking about job titles. I, I think in terms of world events, uh, but I have a theory. So I'd rather hear what you think yeah. first, and then I'll give you my theory. <laughs> so what, what do you think best would be? I, look, he no doubt, you know, was palpably hungry to be recognized as a statesman, uh, you know, to escape uh, the label of being a political handler, no matter how great he was at it. And you could argue, certainly you make the argument, uh, in fact, that his greatness was uh, in understanding and sort of uh, uh, overseeing politics for a long, long run on the national stage, more so uh, than almost any comparable figure. However, what he would say is unequivocally being Secretary of State when the Cold War was ending. And yeah. I think Peter and I, having looked back at this and, you know, having spent four years uh, covering the former Soviet Union, just a decade after those events, um, being able to revisit the, especially Baker's diplomacy around the uh, reunification of Germany after the fall of the Berlin Wall, which, by the way, came as a surprise to Baker and to even most of the experts at the State Department. So there wasn't any playbook, there wasn't any plan. Uh, that existed there and that the pace of events 
was so breathtaking in 1989 and 1990. Uh, and it's, it's a classic example of something that just seems so much more clear cut uh, in hindsight than it did at the moment. And I think that's where Baker uh, was at his most invaluable uh, and where his skills as a deal uh, really came into play. So for me, that's, that's actually not even a close call uh, in terms of uh, his contribution and, and where he was most successful. Yeah, I, I was going to totally agree with you because I have this very clear memory of something that's not in the book, which was right after uh, they left office. So it would have been uh, maybe winter of 93, 94, like a year after they left office. Um, I got invited to go to the German embassy in Washington, which was brand new back then. And we were in this room that was floor to ceiling glass uh, windows and a snowstorm came and it was a whiteout. And so we were suspended on the second or third floor in this, like a glass cube. And the snow was swirling around the room on the outside and Helmut Kohl was there and he was giving the order of merit, not just to George Bush, but also to James Baker. And it's the highest civilian honor in, in Germany. And there was this, this beautiful woman was the translator and as Helmut Kohl started speaking in German, this woman started saying, you know, the translation, and he had this metaphor that there was this river and Helmut Kohl was on one side and Baker and Bush were on the other. And they got him across the river safely along with the rest of the German people. And he would be grateful for the rest of his life for what the two of them had done for Germany. And it was this beautiful moment in this sort of surreal setting and, and I'll never forget it. And so that's why I think uh, that would be Baker's, in his mind, uh, the reunification of Germany uh, really was not inevitable in any way and could have gone very, very poorly, as could have the, the end of the Soviet Union, but. Um, well, that's right. And, and even with, you know, coal, I mean, it was getting across the river. It involved a lot of like, you know, oh, yeah. it worked. One of the things we found out in doing this is that, you know, coal was not even on speaking terms with his own foreign minister the West German foreign minister, who of course wow. was the key uh, player and, and Baker's uh, formal counterpart in the negotiations. I mean, wow. imagine that. So uh, you've got the Soviets, who of course are unhappy about uh, the collapse of East Germany. You've got whatever disarray in East Germany. You've got the West Germans, who are literally feuding with each other. Margaret Thatcher, she's yep. against German reunification. Uh, you know, we like. Germany so much we prefer there be two of them. Yes. Uh, you know, there had been two. And Mitterrand, he wasn't very happy either. Yep. Definitely not. And then by the way, back in Washington, uh, uh, many uh, hawks and uh, you know sort of hardliners in the Pentagon very dubious about this. Even Scowcroft and Bush, this is one area where I would say Baker pushed them uh, as far and at times even farther than they had been prepared to go. So uh, you know, again, to me, that's just a very complicated multi-party uh, uh, deal making uh, happening in real time without all of the available facts. Yeah, so let's, um, we don't have a ton of time left here. And so um, let me ask you this. There was uh, a mention in the book um, when the first time Donald Trump and James Baker met uh, back when dinosaurs roamed the earth in 1985, <laughs> when he was at the treasury, and uh, uh, tell us about when they first met and what, you know, their basic relationship over the years. What, what, what do you know about it? Well, it's, it, Trump was this sort of like, you know, celebrity real estate dude in the 80s on the cover of all these magazines and so forth. But Baker was the Treasury Secretary rewriting the whole tax code. And he was doing it with the Democrats. And that meant there were trade-offs. It meant that things had to be given away in order to get other things because it had to be revenue neutral. Anybody on this call probably knows what that means, which means they couldn't take in more revenue or, or taking less revenue when the tax code was finished, it had to be the same amount. And so whoever, if you, if you added one provision, you had to offset. Well, one of the provisions that was gonna get, uh, you know, hammered was a real estate tax break. And who didn't like that? Donald Trump. And he comes to the treasury department to complain about it to Baker. Baker told us, I think the phrase was, he comes in like a stormtrooper. <laughs> and Trump is just sort of like giving it to him, as you can imagine, knowing him now, what it would have been like then. He wasn't any, any shyer then than he is now. And Baker finally gets fed up with it. And he points out the window. And, and the Treasury Department, of course, is next to the White House. He points out the window and says, you're in the wrong building. The guy who wants to do this is in that building over there. And you need to go see him if you think this uh, uh, this isn't right. And I, that pretty much shut up Trump. 
But, you know, he uh, they had a couple other encounters over the years, but that's the main one uh, when he was still in office. And I think that, you know, he didn't really kind of get together with him again until 2016 uh, when he's put in a room with him while he's running for president. And, and Baker brings a two page, which we've got in the book, two page a memo giving Trump advice on how to run for president, all of which then Trump throws exactly where you think he threw it. <laughs> and uh, and then end up, it sounds like it ends up that Baker votes for Trump twice. He does. Uh, which is quite a surprise to, to uh, some of the people who've interviewed you, I think. Uh, I've listened to a number of podcasts. And, um, uh, and how do you explain that? How does, how does Baker see the Republican Party today? Well, I mean, that is one of the interesting things about working on this book, right, is that it's all happening in parallel with this very unexpected rise of Trump. And it, it becomes, and in the book is in many ways, a story of the modern Republican Party. And yet here is to many people, the unthinkable thing, uh, Jim Baker is sort of the untrump in so many ways, uh, certainly not just as a personification of the establishment, but someone who cares about personal integrity, who was the gold standard for essentially uh, hyper-competence when it came to running the White House, uh, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, not to mention just on an ideological level, uh, the, um, you know, Bush and Baker represented a kind of uh, pragmatic internationalism, uh, a sense that alliances were crucial, uh, 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 certainly not you know, given to unilateral pronouncements. Baker remains a free trader to this day. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, just on a substantive as well as on a just a, an organizational and administrative level seem to be the exact opposite. Baker told us that he also, you know, just in terms of Trump's character, he, he, he used the word nuts. He used the word crazy. He was clearly offended in many ways by Trump. Uh, uh, and yet he couldn't bring himself to break with what he saw as where the Republican Party is. And for us, this was, you know, we asked him the same question as you might imagine over and over again. Uh, and finally, I guess, you know, when the subject of your biography tells you uh, the same thing, you have to listen to him. And I, I think it tells you something about the modern Republican Party, because Baker said to us very clearly, uh, look, I'm still a Republican. Uh, and that means I need to support the, the leader of my party, even if my party has left me. And I don't think he's under any illusions, uh, either about Trump or the state of the GOP. It's not where he is at, either one of those things. Uh, but he came away from his time in Washington with a view that uh, power and wielding it only happens on the inside, uh, that there's not much merit to those who stand on the outside, uh, you know, sort of pissing in, as he would put it. Uh, and you know, I, I think in the end, that's that's what the story is. Uh, it might have also been about Ronald Reagan to a certain extent. I think that he took away from that experience the idea that an outsider who comes to Washington with some outlandish ideological ideas, uh, you know, at least at the beginning of the Trump era, he saw, well, maybe, uh, you know, it, Trump can be governed, can be, uh, you know, constrained and guided uh, by those around him to better outcomes. Um. So, so uh, one of the questions that from the uh, audience here, and then I'll give you my, my final question, uh, but the, the, one of the questions from the audience is uh, something I was gonna ask you about too, is uh, you have this phrase called the plug-in unit. And since the prior um, webinar was all about transition planning and personnel, um, some people called it Baker's dozen, but that's not quite right because there, he didn't have a dozen people that went with him from job to job. Uh, but there was a small group of staffers that stayed with James Baker for years and years. Uh, it seems to me that George Bush sort of cast a wider and wider net as he went from job to job. They both accumulated more and more job skills depending on what job they were in. But it seemed that Bush had this, like I said, a, a bigger and broader coalition of people that started going with him. But, but he had to do that to be elected to office. And Baker had this these trusted advisors, um, uh, one of whom, you know, is a friend of mine. I shared office space after we lost, left office with Margaret Tutwiler. And we were actually in the office the day that OJ got in the white Bronco <laughs> and uh, Mr. Baker came in for a meeting with Margaret and we, uh, we all watched OJ on the highway. Anyway, <laughs> so, so what can you tell us about the types of people that were his trusted advisors and how he, how he relied on them? Well, you're exactly right. I think it's one of the keys to his success. Obviously, Bob Zelik, uh, Dick Darman, Margaret Tutwiler, obviously, 
Janet Mullins, uh, you know, Dennis Ross, a handful of people who, who did travel with him from place to place. I'm leaving some out, I shouldn't, Bob Kimmett. Um, and I think he just, he trusted their judgment, he trusted their intelligence, and he wasn't afraid to have people with him who were smart and who were talented. You know, and a lot, too often in Washington, politicians want people to tell them yes and want them to tell them, you know, gosh, you're great. And I think these people did actually, you know, genuinely admire Baker, but they also told him when they thought he was wrong. Margaret Tyler yeah. is a great example. She was on his case about Tiananmen Square. Why aren't you out there saying more? Why aren't you doing more? She was on his case about Yugoslavia. When she thought he was wrong, she told him. And, um, and he gave it back. I mean, they had that kind of relationship. And I think that uh, he didn't mind having smart people. In fact, he liked having smart people. And he wasn't an originator of ideas. He wasn't a visionary. He wasn't the vision thing guy, right? To use Bush's phrase. Mm -hmm. But he understood that other people had good ideas. And he wasn't, a, he wasn't afraid of then taking those ideas and then, you know, putting them into place. So two plus four, which was the formulation he used for that German reunification we just talked about, mm -hmm. was, was produced by his staff. And he took it from that plug-in unit and then ran with it. So he trusted these people and he brought them from place to place. He, would, he gets to the State Department, he says, this is a hostile takeover, even though it's from Reagan to Bush, Republican to Republican, it's because he's brought his own people. Now that causes some sore feelings among the career staff. Uh, they didn't uh, like that, that he sort of seemed to dis. Uh, you know, disrespect them in their view. But ultimately, I think they came around to, to, to respecting him because he was the center of the action and they realized that they could, uh, they could you know, have some influence. Um, so, so one of the great quotes that I found, I, um, I was a big fan of uh, one of your colleagues at the Post, Marjorie Williams, who uh, died young and left this book behind that her husband edited called The Woman at the Washington Zoo, which is one of my favorite books. Yes. And she wrote all these great profiles for people who don't know who she is. She wrote all these great profiles of these Washington characters. And you quote her in the intro. And I went back and read her original uh, piece on um, Baker that has the headline, Jim Baker is smooth, shrewd, tough, and coolly ambitious. This is why Washington loves him. And uh, so it was from January of 89, just as he was going into uh, Secretary of State. And there's a great quote in there from Lee Atwater who says, I think James Baker will go down in the same sense that John Foster Dulles went down in his, area, his era, and Harry Hopkins went down in his era, and Daniel Webster went down in his era. I think he's a titan, and he is just entering the job that will define him. And what struck me about that quote is, there are plenty of quotes in this book of people who say, after the fact, now, oh, he's right up there with Nixon and Kissinger, and he's you know, the greatest in you know, the last 50 years. But for Lee Atwater, to say it before the Berlin Wall falls down and before uh, the Persian Gulf War and before the reunification of Germany. Um, I mean, some of it is, like you said earlier, the right time, the right place, um, but there's more to it than that, I think. And Marjorie Williams also finishes her piece by saying, Washington loves the ones who grease its gears, but history only remembers the ones who shift them. And which would you say he, he was. Was he the greaser of the gears or was he the one who shifted them? Because he, he did both. And, but what do you think he's going to remember for? What, what's the takeaway? Well, you know, I'm so glad you, you used that because that helped us to think about, uh, you know, the book and that we use that quote in the introduction to the yeah. book. Uh, and remember, as you said, this was written as Jim Baker became the Secretary of State in the beginning of 1989. What she didn't know then, uh, what he didn't know then, was that the unraveling of the Soviet empire uh, in Eastern Europe was happening uh, much sooner than anyone thought in a much more dramatic way. And it was going to play out that very year. Uh, in fact, there's a memo uh, from the experts at the State Department to Jim Baker uh, right around the exact same time uh, that, uh, that this profile of him is written in which uh, they say, German unification is a pipe dream. Uh, it's a beautiful fantasy and it ain't gonna happen uh, anytime soon. Sorry, bub. And so Marjorie Williams, I think she nailed it when it came to Baker the man and how he operated and his sort of uh, the mythos of Jim Baker that had been acquired through two terms of Reagan, right? You know, he was the 
smooth operator. He was the deal maker. He was right. beloved. Of the Velvet press. Hammer. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. He was beloved of the press because he always gave the you know background briefings and ended up in the center of the heroic action in every Time magazine cover story about the big event of the week. What she missed though was that the gears of history were moving. Uh, and that Baker was in a very short order after she wrote that piece, going to have the chance to move them. As Peter said, he was not a visionary, uh, but the truth is that the revolution was happening regardless of uh, uh, who set it in motion. You know, he didn't make the Berlin Wall fall. Uh, George Bush didn't make the Berlin Wall fall. It was the accident of history that put them there at that moment. But the reason that we wrote a book about him and the reason that he's remembered today is what he did uh, with that moment. Uh, and if you want, if you ever want a secretary of state who actually happens to be supremely gifted at both crisis management and deal making, it would be at the exact moment when events are happening with that kind of dizzying speed. So, you know, again, that that's the reason we wrote the book. It doesn't turn out to be, there were a lot of surprises for us along the way. Uh, about Washington and Baker, but um, you know he 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 moved the gears. It seems to me. Wow, Peter. Final final uh, question: Can there ever be another James Baker, <laughs> the uh, creature of his times? What do you I think? want? I want to say yes, Good. but at the moment it seems hard to imagine. There, I think the people in Washington who want to be Jim Baker, who have the in inclination to want to make deals, who to 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 make Washington work. It's just the structure has changed in a way that, that that it makes it harder. And so at the moment, it's 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 hard to see a Jim Baker being successful when you can't even get a COVID relief bill in eight months when both parties actually agree you need it. You know, you need a Jim Baker or at least an environment in which a Jim Baker can ma can manage. And right now, we don't seem to have it. Now we'll see what happens. Uh, Washington changes, it ebbs and flows. Uh, but one of the reasons why we wanted to do this book because Washington is the other big character in it, and Washington has changed. And the question is whether it will change back or change in a different direction. Boy, I certainly hope so. We'll keep hope alive. Uh, here's Bill Antholis coming back to us here. And uh, well, I, I want to start by thanking Mary Kate. Mary Kate, that was terrific. If there's anybody that, that knows great fun. <laughs> the Bush presidency, it's you. And having you as a colleague is one of the best parts of my job. But also, Thank you. Peter and Susan, the only thing that I'm disappointed about is usually when we have guests, I get them to sign the book. But I will bring okay. it to DC for a signature. <laughs> it was. It's been such... A uh, great pleasure for me to get to know both of you during my time at the Miller Center, but particularly watching you in action. My wife and I have a hard enough time writing a grocery list together. <laughs> and the idea that you could write this book together and seeing how you just interacted on a couple of these questions, like when Mary Kate asked the question about shifting gears or greasing them. Uh, that <laughs> we can't, we can't do a grocery list together, but we, the book's okay, but the <laughs> grocery list is hard. <laughs> That's hard, seriously. Stay out of my turf. I'm not allowed to do the grocery list. <laughs> I was able to order carry out while listening to you guys, while keeping every single word and negotiating oh, that. Good, good. Was, but, but seriously, thank you so much. You, you yes, educate you. us all on a daily basis. You've been great partners and friends to the Miller Center on so many different issues, but you've now educated the country and a, uh, a great statesman that, that we all treasure. We got uh, to know him, obviously, through the oral histories, and then again through the making of the film that you were both so helpful to us, both Susan as a uh, as a featured person in the film. Peter, I'm not sure why we didn't get you on film, but you were both so helpful to That's us. That's a better one. Yeah. <laughs> but thank you both. And uh, the book is obviously already super successful. It's on everybody's top 10 list, uh, hopefully on people's holiday shopping list. Um, uh, and we look forward to the next one, whatever that is. Yeah, thank you for thank you for spending years on such a worthwhile project, and uh, I, I really do think no matter what your political perspective, everyone can learn something from this book, uh, and what a remarkable life he's led. So, so thank you for for doing that. Well, thank you, Mary Kay. This is a sort of fun conversation. I can't think of anybody who'd be more fun to do it with. You were fabulous, okay. and Bill, thank you thank for hosting you. us, and thank you for all the help you've given us over the years. Really, it means a lot. Wonderful. And thanks to everyone who tuned in. Thanks yeah, for joining thank us. You. Have a great cool. night, everyone. Thank you. And finally, to our team at the Miller Center that puts these things together. You guys all work so hard. And we've kept everybody for two hours tonight, but it was really worth it. So thanks, and we'll see you in the next webinar. Thank you. Good night.